It's uh, 1.05 p.m. in Los Angeles on uh, Thursday, the 13th of June, 2013. I'm Mark Strassman, reporter with Utopia News. I'm about to talk to Akil Matthew, who is a spokesperson for DeVest Harvard. Welcome to Utopia News. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, tell us how you got involved with DeVest Harvard, how it came to your attention, and how you decided to get involved. So I guess when for me I, I had never sort of done anything any sort of like environmental activism before, and but I, I guess I I'd, I'd, I'd heard about climate change and it, it just seemed more and more serious and it was surprising that no one was really um, the political system was was so unable to to deal with the problem, uh, and then I, I just heard about this this small group at the beginning of of, uh, of last year um, that was, that was going to try to get the university to divest its endowment. And it seemed like a, a great, a great thing to do and a great way to draw attention to it. And so that's sort of how I got involved when, uh, when things were, were starting out. Okay. What does divest Harvard want Harvard University to do exactly? Well, so our, our ask is, is that Harvard, uh, divest its endowment, um, from the top 200 fossil fuel companies. So that, uh, that's a, a complicated process. Our, our first ask is, is that Harvard uh, sell off all its direct holdings. So that's the easiest part, selling the, the direct holdings. Um, but there are, and, and then commit to, to not buying new, uh, new stocks uh, from fossil fuel companies. And then the long-term goal is a complete divestment. So that would involve talking to mutual funds and, uh, and asking them to, uh, for, for a fossil fuel-free portfolio. How much fossil fuel uh, property does uh, Harvard own right now? So we don't know um, because Harvard's investments in general are not public. Um, we do have some information about their direct holdings, and I believe they have um, maybe $20 million invested in direct holdings. They've indicated that they have. Um, we, did talk, we did ask them before starting the campaign, and they, they told us that they had a significant um, portion of the endowment invested in fossil fuel companies. How big is the total Harvard endowment right now? Oh, I think it's about $30 billion. So $20 million is not so much. Well, those are direct holdings, which make a small portion of the total endowment. Li likely there, there's much more. And where do you think it is, and what efforts are you making to discover what it is, and, and how successful have you been with that? Well, so we don't we don't know too much about uh, about Harvard's indirect holdings because those aren't publicly disclosed, and uh, we we don't we just don't have that information. But we do know that um, we we do have some information about their direct holdings, and we do estimate that I mean our our guess is that maybe maybe ten percent of of the endowment is in fossil fuel companies, just based on um, what uh, what typical investment for portfolios look like. Uh, close to $3 billion then. Uh, yeah. Okay. When, when, you, when you're asking Harvard to divest, who exactly in the hierarchy and the structure of the administration are you asking to make that decision? Well, so, so Harvard has this uh, board of overseers, um, a group of, of people who, uh, I guess that, yeah, it's the board. And, but we're, we're especially trying to so, so our group is, has met with a couple of members from the board. There are a couple of members that are on a task force that are, which is specifically uh, focused on uh, issues of socially responsible investing. And then we're, we're also trying to take our message directly to President Drew Faust. We've, we've gone to our office hours and, uh, and uh, tried to um, explain our campaign to her. And what has her reaction been? Well, most most of uh, most of the members of the Harvard administration they they do uh, they do recognize climate change to their credit and they certainly um, have taken steps at Harvard to um, for instance to do sustainability initiatives on campus um, but in general we we still have a, a long way to go to convince them that uh, that divestment is is important. Now President Faust paid a lot of attention to climate change in her commencement address. Was that encouraging yeah. or frustrating? I guess it's both because on the one hand, she she does um, she does recognize climate change and she she has taken steps to to address it, um, but on the other hand, you have uh, you know Harvard has spent spends a lot of money and and effort in, into into research on climate change, and uh, it, it seems like it, it's one of the biggest 
it's it's the biggest uh, issue of our time, I think, and uh, it's it's surprising that we, it, it's frustrating that we still haven't been able to convince them to sort of put their money where their uh, their mouth is. Okay, what what steps and what uh, techniques are you using to con to convince the administration of your uh, issues? Well, we've been reaching out to student groups. So we we, for instance, we got a an endorsement from. Uh, the, the Harvard College Democrats, among among many other student groups, uh, and hopefully more as uh, as time goes on, we're we're reaching out to faculty. We we just reached 100 faculty uh, who have signed our, our resolution saying that they support our campaign. Um, we're also reaching out to alumni. Um, we have about 240 alumni or so, including um, so Al Gore, for instance. We we reached out to him, and he uh, he endorsed us in a in a speech uh, on campus. Um, and then, yeah, we've been we've been uh, trying to uh, sort of build a lot of support from this, and we're hoping that, say, alumni will start writing letters to the administration. And once uh, once there's enough pressure, then then Harvard will will divest. Now, who who is opposing divestment? Well, so so I think the uh, I think among the student body, most people support divestment. So we had a student referendum, and seventy two percent of uh, well, 70% of those who voted, which was 55% of the undergraduate student body, supported divestment, and that was a huge, uh, that was a huge success. Um, I guess who's opposing it? Well, we have a few faculty members who who have said that they're, they they don't support it, but um, it seems like at least most of the faculty faculty members that have gotten back to us do seem like they support us. Um, so, so I guess some of the opposition is coming from the administration. And what about the companies themselves who are about to be divested? Have they weighed in at all? Oh, I, yeah, I guess they're not too, uh, too thrilled about it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the companies that, uh, the fossil fuel companies have started to notice that there are these divestment campaigns, and they've, they've sort of started to react to it by trying to, um, trying to polish their image. So that's a good sign that we're, we're having an impact. But we, have, we, we do have a long way to go. What's the argument that divestment leads to an improvement of climate change? Well, it's sort of, uh, well, divestment directly doesn't, but the point is that divestment sort of opens up space in the political system. So it's, uh, it's 2013, and climate change has been mainstream science since the 1980s. Um, and uh, even now that there, there hasn't, the U.S. still hasn't taken a, a major step to address climate change, like a carbon tax or a cap-and-trade system. And uh, it seems like the, the problem is, is that fossil fuel companies have too much power in our political system, and they've, they've prevented this kind of legislation. So our goal is to, is to take away the social license of these companies. We want to say that these, these are companies whose business model is based on the assumption that there's going to be a catastrophic amount of climate change. The proven reserves of these fossil fuel companies, including state-owned companies, is several times what the best science predicts that we can burn and stay within, say, two degrees of warming, which is what uh, the world has agreed on as an upper limit. So our, our goal is, is, uh, is uh, political in the end. It's to open up space for political action. How would you uh, uh, measure the or, or judge the relative political power of your group versus the uh, fossil fuel industry? <laughs> well, they're a bit more powerful than we are. <laughs> Um, but we're hoping that, uh, I mean, we're, hope, we're trying to appeal to universities and universities who, where, where universities where, well, universities are, are where much of the work uh, regarding climate change has taken place. And they also have uh, an important role in, in shaping public opinion and uh, in shaping the political world. So, so our hope is that even though we're, we're less powerful than, than Exxon and, and the, the big fossil fuel companies, we can still have an impact um, with a popular movement. What do you want the university to do with the money that it uh, gets from selling its uh, fossil fuel stocks? Well, we're hoping that uh, the university will reinvest in socially responsible companies. So that could involve reinvesting specifically in, in clean energy, or, or it could in, involve just reinvesting in things that aren't fossil fuel companies. Um, I mean, the university has done this before. They've divested from tobacco, for instance. and. Uh, I mean, this campaign in general is modeled on the divestment from uh, apartheid South, Af South Africa in the, in the 1980s. Uh, what kind of tactics have you used so far, and what kind of tactics do you see yourself using in the future? 
Well, so far, um, so far we've just been sort of building support and trying to gain visibility. So we uh, are one of our big events last uh, last year was a, was this uh, this rally that we had. We had 150 people around the administration's office, um, and we had speakers, including a, a faculty member who works on environment related stuff. Um, and it was it was a real success. The the administration we we were we presented them we wanted to present them our our petition signatures over a thousand of them. And they initially weren't gonna gonna come out and take it, but we had enough sort of social pressure that they did. They, we convinced them to come outside and publicly acknowledge our campaign and accept the petition signatures. Um, so in the future, we will be thinking about reaching out to alumni and trying to 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 help to, to ask them to start exerting pressure on the university. Um, and we're gonna yeah we're gonna keep holding rallies and. Well, we haven't figured out our, our, our eventual tactics, I guess. Is, is civil disobedience beyond the pale for what you're considering? I think there's no question that civil disobedience is going to be necessary for, um, uh, for this movement. Um, it, it, it's weird. It, it, took, it took massive civil disobedience to, to, for, for this nation to get civil rights. Um, and climate change is a huge issue. There, there have already been thousands of people who've... Uh, have gotten themselves arrested um, protesting climate change, and I think we are we are yeah. What what things would you say distinguish the members of your group from non-members? What what drives them to consider climate change so important that they need to get involved in this uh, movement? Well, many of us uh, our our academic interests are uh, are in that area. I guess that doesn't apply to me, but we have a lot of uh, people who are say environmental. Uh, well, I guess I guess we don't call it environmental studies, but but that that sort of thing um, that's what they major in. Um, so they they spend a lot of time engaging with these issues. And I guess I guess we have some members who've been doing uh, environmental activism since they were like twelve. They they were just they're just veterans. Um, and then for the rest of us, I don't know. I guess we all sort of got interested from for different reasons. I do think most people, uh, most college students, do care about climate change. It's uh, it's a problem that are generation is going to uh, going to have to deal with quite a bit and uh, yeah okay um, talk about uh, divest Harvard's relationship to the rest of the divest movement and and uh, what role it's playing yeah I guess um, I mean I don't know that much about um, the rest of the divestment movement I, I've had the opportunity to meet some of uh, uh, some, some other people uh, from other from other campuses um, I think uh, I think we're I think we're all we're all in this together. There's a, there's a nice website, gofossilfree.org, um, for for this divestment movement. And well, it's not just on university campuses. It's also uh, um, it's also in in local city governments and uh, uh, for divesting pension funds. I think uh, one thing that uh, we did we did well was uh, we were the first we were the first university to to have a referendum. On the issue of fossil fuel divestment, and that was in uh, last November, and we got that was when we got 72% support, and that got a lot of media attention. And since then, other other universities, uh, uh, other groups at other universities, uh, have have uh, had their own referendums, and some of them have done much better than uh, 72%. So that that was uh, uh, that was something that that I think our group did well. What's the time frame that you expect uh, it'll take for you to get results? Well. Um, I think I think we're already getting results, and that we're we're helping to to draw attention to climate change. Um, but as far as actually divesting, I think our goal was uh, was that it take a couple of years um, to to convince Harvard or to convince uh, universities to to commit to divestment, and then they I guess hopefully they'd agree to like a five year time frame to to actually divest. Do you have much of an infrastructure in your own organization? Do you uh, uh, have uh, officers and meetings and uh, web pages and so on? Yeah, so we we just have a, a brand new web page now, divestharvard.com. Um, and we, well, we had a we had a website before that, but it's completely uh, revamped now. Um, I guess for structures, we have weekly meetings, um, weekly meetings as a as a whole group, and then we have working groups for for specific issues. Um, we we are generally non-hierarchical, but we did sort of uh, uh, we did we did have we do now have small officer positions um, to help coordinate things. Okay. We try to 
we, we try to decide things as a group. All right. You, you work by, uh, by the methods that uh, Occupy uses. Um, yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, right. talk, uh, talk about, uh, why don't you wrap up by talking about your case in general, why divestment of fossil fuels is important for uh, climate change. Uh, sorry, I think I think something went wrong with the connection. I missed the first part of your question. It did. Uh, uh, talk about your philosophical uh, orientation on the relationship between uh, divestment and climate change, and, and why divestment is a strategy to help mitigate climate change. Well, I think I think the the main the main thing is that these these companies, the the fossil fuel companies, um, they're spending. Well, it. I guess uh, that they're they're spending billions of dollars in in trying to get new fossil fuel reserves, um, and their their whole business model they're they're assuming that there's going to be a catastrophic amount of climate change. Um, a carbon bubble where um, where a lot of this this carbon, a lot of these fossil fuel reserves that uh, these companies are picking up. Is, is just going to be unburnable once uh, once the world does enact meaningful climate change legislation, and it's it's going to be a huge amount of uh, wasted assets, trillions of dollars in assets that are uh, going to be lost. Um, I think that I think that you can make an argument, and I, I I've seen this argument made that you know hey may, maybe the world's just not going to act on climate change, and maybe maybe then fossil fuel companies are great investments because we're going to keep. Uh, keep burning um, well beyond what we can uh, burn according to the science, but uh, that would be a, a very difficult, um, a very difficult argument, I think, for any university to make. Um, so, so uh, are are you hoping then that the um, that the the resources so that I'm are sorry, is the connection okay? No, we're having a little bit of a problem, but it's uh, you're coming through pretty well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there was I'm, a, I'm sorry. There was a problem. It's it's jerking. It's uh, it's stalling a little bit, but you're okay mostly. Okay. Okay. So 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 finally, what's the argument that uh, the uh, invest the continued investment in fossil fuels is not a good economic policy for the university to take? Oh well, that's sort of this idea of a carbon bubble that. Um, that most of these assets, that most of what the fossil fuels own, fossil fuel companies own, most of their reserves, uh, most of what their their value is based upon, are is, is simply just going to be unburnable. It's going to be useless because uh, we it, it, we we can't burn um, like twenty. Per, we can't burn more than like twenty or thirty percent of the world's fossil fuel reserves right now uh, without uh, crossing the two degree two degree limit. Uh, and so there there are trillions of dollars of of those fossil fuel reserves that we're going to have to leave in the ground, um, and I think I think that's the real economic argument. And I think a lot of people are, are waking up to this. There was a, a report by uh, uh, the London School of Economics, um, or someone at the London School of Economics, Lord Stern, I think. And uh, there's uh, there's this uh, carbon tracker uh, project that's sort of drawing it, really drawing attention to to this fact that fossil fuel companies are are really an economic bubble. So you understand this connection between the inability to burn the even the reserves that have been found already and the economic impact of that. How are you going to get that message out to more people? Well, I think that's what this campaign is about. I think I think in our campaign we have sort of focused more on the ethical arguments for divestment. But I think we're also going to focus maybe next year uh, in, on the economics, uh, when we try to convince the administration that it's also a sound financial decision, um, I think. Uh, I have think, you, I enlist, think have you enlisted some? Have you enlisted some econo uh, economists to to help you make the argument? Well, we've been trying to reach out to some economists. Um, so far, we've been we we haven't we haven't done done that too much. Um, but I think well, I mean. The Economist itself, the, the magazine, ran a ran a story about this. So I, I think I think economists are going to start taking uh, divestment more and more seriously. Okay. Finally, how optimistic are you that you're going to succeed? I think we're definitely going to succeed um, because because eventually climate change is 
it, it's going to become clear. It's, it's, it's weird that climate change is such a big problem that so many scientific reports have said so, so many reports by NGOs, and yet it hasn't sort of really permeated the public consciousness in a way that would make divestment seem sort of like the obvious moral right thing to do. Um, and I think that's going to happen in time. Um, I, I, I just hope that I'm an optimist, so I think, I think that Harvard and, um, well, universities in general are going to be, going to be divesting in the next few years. I think, I think we can do this. I think we have a lot of power and a lot of determination. Okay, good. Well, I want to thank you for your, uh, your work on this issue and for talking to us about it today on Utopia News. Well, thank you. Bye. Bye.